welcome to Big Bang Week at the Wigtown Book Festival. I'd like to start with a massive shout out of thanks to the funders, the Batchworth Trust and the Kilgalliac Community Fund. My name is Lee Randall and our guest tonight is Dr. Joe Marchant, best-selling author of Cure, The Shadow King and Decoding the Heavens. Tonight we're talking about her new book, The Wonderful, The Human Cosmos. As ever, before we start, let me remind you that there are links to the Festival Bookshop and to a donate button. If you can help support our wonderful authors, if you can help support this fantastic festival, we'll be really, really grateful and so pleased and happy. There are buttons everywhere. There are buttons on the Wigtown uh, Festival website. There's a button on YouTube, and you can just uh, donate right through that or buy a book that way. Um, if you're watching this live, please send us your questions by using the comments field on YouTube or using the question button located right beneath our little heads on the festival website. We will get to as many of those questions as we can. So if you're ready, let's begin. If I was to ask you, when's the last time you checked your phone? I'm betting that most of you would say five minutes ago, or some of you would say I'm actually double screening right now. But if I was to ask you, when's the last time you really, really looked up at the night sky to contemplate the enormity of the universe, then I'm guessing that there would be a very different answer, especially if you're like me and you live in a city, especially one with a lot of light pollution. So the human cosmos explores the history of man's relationship to the stars, what we've learned from the cosmos, how it shaped our philosophy, our art, our religions, even our biology. Every chapter spotlights a different moment in history and looks at what all the planets and stars meant to the humans and how they inspired Western civilization. It's also a really important warning about what we lose by separating ourselves from the galaxy. So let's blast off. Welcome, Joe. It is such a pleasure to be here with you or to be here with you digitally, at least. Yeah, I'm sorry not to be there in person, but hi, thank you for having me. I want to talk to you. I want to start with the idea of awe. Um, I was so thrilled to read this book. Uh, a couple of years ago, I went to a big Brian Cox, Robin Ince theater event with big, images of the cosmos and all kinds of stuff going on. And I, it was like a drug. I felt so at one with the universe. I felt both tiny and insignificant. And also I wanted to go out and throw my arms around every human being on earth and say, we're all in this together. Let's band together and make the world wonderful. And you describe that as a very common experience when people encounter the cosmos. And I'm guessing that it was very much the launch point, the jumping off point for you for writing the book. Would that be correct? It was certainly one of them. There were several kind of ways in which I came to the book, but one of them was absolutely an experience that I talk about in the book, which was in Mexico, where I traveled there on a completely different assignment and had a sort of difficult and a bit dangerous journey into the mountains, ended up in a little sort of one person tent with this torrential thunderstorm not really quite sure where I was or if I was safe or if I was going to get washed away uh, and then waking up in the middle of the night once the rain had stopped and I came out and feeling you know nervous anxious and then just looked up and my just it took my breath away the stars were just incredible I think we forget at home particularly those of us who live in cities we just forget how amazing the night sky really is. It's so rare that you actually see a properly dark sky. This was in the sort of Mexico mountains. The thunderstorm had knocked out the power for miles around and there was no moon that night. It was just stars. It was just silver. And it does something so profound to, to you. It's like a sort of transcendent experience. It's a, it lifts you up. And it's an experience that People have written about all through history about feeling connected with the bigger cosmos, feeling lifted up to the stars. It has a name, it's called um, celestial vaulting. But mm. psychologists nowadays, they would call that a, um, an example of the emotion of awe, which they would define as the feeling that we get when we're confronted with something vast. It's like so vast that it dwarfs us, that it's um, 
beyond our capacity to comprehend it there's often an edge of fear to or as well that you're kind of out of your comfort zone this isn't something that you can kind of understand or conquer or, or control you're just at the mercy of this enormous thing and what's really intriguing about that is that when people feel awe, it seems it does something quite profound to them it, in studies so when psychologists look at awe, they quite often will induce it in their studies by showing people the stars there's lots of other ways that you can get awe, but the starry sky is like the most vast thing out there it's a sort of quintessential source of awe. and when people feel awe, they feel uh, more curious they're more creative they're happier and less stressed but even more interestingly they it seems to change people's outlook so they are more generous after they make more ethical decisions they're more likely to make sacrifices to help other people people say they feel more connected to something bigger they care less about money and more about the planet so one of the things that fascinates me about the sky is that when we really experience it the stars the proper stars it's really doing something very important to us it's not just a, a pretty view i think it's something that's really important about uh, important for our sort of mental well-being and our, our outlook on life making us less sort of concerned with our, ourselves and, and more connected and, and looking outwards yeah um and you what you do is you brilliantly trace that through history but just before I get you to tell some of those stories um obviously you have a background in science you have a PhD in genetics and medical microbiology and you're a science communicator so science is your your world but but this work also criticizes something that you describe as the move from the subjective to the objective and I know that's something that's going to weave through our conversation throughout the rest of the time we're together. Could you just sort of ex define and explain what you mean by that? Yeah, this is a very um, thorny issue that people have, have talked about and been fascinated by for centuries. But I really mean the difference between the external sort of third person world that we can measure it's it's quantitative you can put a number to it and somebody else can agree on, on that number they'll get the same number so it's the kind of mathematical physical external world that we can study with science that we can measure and, and model with mathematics um, and then the subjective is the internal world so your experience that sort of inner world that nobody else can access so your thoughts your feelings sensations so the color red for example so the objective kind of scientific description of red might be the particular frequency of light that that causes something to look red and that's something that we can measure and agree on but that actual sensation of redness when you look at something that's something that you can't share with anybody else you you don't we don't know if we all see the same red it could look different to all of us we can agree on whether something is red or not but but what it's like to see red, um, I think, it is is different. Um, it's sort of the qualitative versus the quantitative, mm -hmm. if you like. And yeah, in writing the story, I was of this book. I wanted to look at how the the stars and the cosmos, how that view has been important to humanity through history. And I was interested as well in how our beliefs about the cosmos have changed. And and you know, building that objective view of science has been a really important part of that. And so I, I didn't really necessarily plan it, but just in following that story, you can't, I couldn't help but sort of be struck by how really what every sort of step along the way that you look at, it's what, what humans have done is take that sort of objective, um, you know, building that objective understanding, making measurements, we're building that scientific knowledge of the universe so that now our understanding of what the universe is, um, where it came from, where we fit within it, who we are really, that's, it's coming from um, our, our measurements, our experiments, our, our instruments, um, and not anymore as it used to be from our own eyes and our own experience. And I love mm -hmm science as you say that's my background it's just this elegant powerful body of information we can see with our telescopes further into the universe than anybody ever has before we understand so much more about it we know about 
black holes and then neutron stars and supernovae. We know how elements have burned, you know, forged in stars, and and then that's um, the elements that make up our own bodies. So there's so much that connects us with the universe from that scientific understanding. But I became very interested in what have we lost when we no longer look to the stars, when our own experience is no longer seen as an important source of information about who we are, where we fit, what reality is, what does that do to us? Mm. So, so we'll begin our, we'll begin our journey because you explain that the sky is something that we have in common now with all of humanity since forever. And yes, the stars may have shifted tiny amounts of tiny degrees, but they are the same stars. They are in the same configuration. And, um, and that you say that star myths are not just stories, they're cultural memories passed through generations for thousands of years. And you start the book with, and I hope I pronounce this correctly, the Pleiades, Pleiades? Uh, um, I mean, it varies, but um, Pleiades will do. Oh, sorry, the Pleiades, see, I knew I was gonna get that wrong. But also how perfect for us to be talking about that today because today is the day that the Mars Perseverance rover was going to be as close to that cluster of stars as it was ever going to get. Um, and I just wonder, I tried Googling, I didn't see that there were any fresh pictures yet that have been released. But I just wonder, can you talk about why you start with that group of stars? Yeah, so I wanted to go back to the beginning, to the Paleolithic and our earliest ancestors and try and, you know, piece together as much as we can about what their cosmos was like. Did they look to the stars? Did they think about them, tell stories about them? Why was the cosmos important to them? Um, and so I started in Lascaux Cave in France, which has these incredible cave paintings, these animals that leap across the, the walls and the ceiling that are around 20,000 years old. Um, and one painting in particular, it's an oryx bull known as bull number 18. And it's, it's more than five meters long. It's this sort of incredible creature with these horns pointing forwards. And But the, the interesting thing about it is that just above its shoulder is this pattern of six dots. There's a little row of four and a little row of two. And it's a very distinctive pattern. And you see that same pattern popping up in art through history and around the planet. You see it in Native American art. You see it um, in art of the shamans from Siberia. You, you see a slightly modified version of this pattern in the logo of the Japanese car manufacturer, Subaru. Yeah. And in, in all of those cases, the dots represent the star cluster, the Pleiades. And you've got this exactly the same pattern above this bull in Lascaux Cave 20,000 years ago. And what makes it even more intriguing is that the Pleiades is actually at the shoulder of the bull in our constellation Taurus. And yeah. so you can put the constellation Taurus, a, a drawing of that next to this Oryx bull from Lascaux Cave, and they basically look the same. You've got the, the horns defined by stars at their tips. You've got the prominent eye, which is the star Aldebaran. There's a speckle on the face for the Hyades. You've got the Pleiades at the shoulder. So I started the book investigating really this idea of could that be representing the Pleiades and the constellation Taurus, could the people of the Paleolithic have been painting star maps? If they were, why would they have wanted to? Could a story or an image like that really have survived from then until now? Is that even possible? Um, and that was a way in really to looking at the kind of cosmos that those people would have had. And, you know, we can't know for sure what that painting meant, but there is quite a lot of circumstantial evidence around it. Um, for example, there is um, work analyzing myths about the stars. There's one in particular called the Cosmic Hunt where um, an animal is, is hunted and chased up into the sky and it transforms into a constellation. And this is a very common story that you find all around the planet. Different versions, there might be a dip, the animal might be different, one hunter or many, but you see versions of that story from ancient Greece to Africa to America. And researchers have done a, a sort of a, like a family tree analysis on the different versions of the stories, looking at the similarities and differences. And so working out this family tree of relationships. And they concluded that that story originated in the Paleolithic more than 15,000 years ago. Probably it would have been an elk originally in that story. Um, and so that is sort of evidence that the story that, well, first of all, people at that time were telling stories about the stars. 
And second, that those stories can survive until now. So that's what I meant about the, the cultural memories. These aren't just stories, but they're linking us to the people of the Paleolithic, which I find quite awe-inspiring in itself. Yeah. Um, but there's also work that like anthropologists can look at more recent hunter-gatherer communities and look at, well, how do they relate to the cosmos? So people who might have had lifestyles quite similar to the people of Lascaux. Um, and what's really striking is that for all of them, the cosmos is absolutely central to their lives. It's in their art, often their houses model the cosmos in re religious beliefs and, and rituals. Their elites are kind of defined by knowledge of the sky and when the solstice is coming. And this is because their environment is absolutely shaped by the sky. So you've got you know, the movements of the sun, obviously, through the seasons. Um, so the winter solstice is a really uh, key time when the, the sun has been receding and, and um, the, the Chumash used to live in California. They had these rituals on the winter solstice with a stick with a quartz stone on the top. And they used to use that to try and pull the, the sun back again to stop it from just disappearing into the winter. So that was a real kind of life and death, you know, what the sun was doing. You need that for life on Earth. Um, but also uh, throughout the seasons, different star constellations rise and set become visible and hunter-gatherer communities will often relate those risings and settings of different constellations with the natural changes that are happening at the same time on earth often their calendars will be um, related to what's going on um, in the sky um, so for example the uh, native american blackfoot people traditionally associate the visibility of the pleiades with the bison Bull with its life cycle um, which they hunt so when the Pleiades set it's time to hunt so you've got sort of events on earth and sky entwined and it's been suggested that maybe that was what was going on with the bull in Lascaux cave that they could have um, associated the visibility of the Pleiades with the life cycle of the oryx bull which was really important to them and perhaps that was the origin of this constellation of a bull in the sky um, but really the main thing Sort of the point coming out of that is just this holistic cosmos where there was people didn't make a distinction between themselves and nature between earth and sky between external world and internal experience there was just this one interconnected system where everything was changing together and for these tribes and groups now that's still true but for the rest of us for most of us and certainly here in the west Basically, as you say, we've been trying to separate ourselves from the cosmos on a daily basis. And I'm wondering if that, I'm wondering why that should be, why we should be, you know, trying to push it away rather than pull it in. But also, I'm wondering if that is not, reading your book, I also developed this belief that we owe the Babylonians everything. That they, it seems, it, it, I just, I was so impressed by them. You can't, everything that we, they seem to have invented everything on our behalf, on behalf of the rest of the world. And I'm just wondering if they kind of kicked, if some of their inventions didn't kick off this separation. Yeah, you're absolutely right. A lot of things started with the Babylonians. Like we often think of the ancient Greeks as maybe being the ones who invented science and all sorts of other things. Not it, according to this. <laughs> yeah, it goes back beyond that. So. The Babylonians were living in ancient Mesopotamia um, and that were sort of among the, the first civilizations to arise, the first writing going back to around the third millennium BC. And so when it comes to written records, you know, before we have to kind of make guesses, how what were people thinking? What did these paintings mean? But if we want written records of what were people actually sort of thinking and doing, then it's the, the clay tablets of ancient Mesopotamia. Um, and there's a particular library that was discovered in the 19th century um, in the city of from the city of Nineveh which is near um, what's now Mosul in Iraq um, and this was the library of an Assyrian king called Ashurbanipal who ruled in the um, 7th century BC and he was obsessed with collecting texts so his empire included um, ancient Babylon and, and he collected texts from all over his empire and there are thousands of these clay tablets some of them are um, are sort of centuries old. And so this is a, an incredible insight into the sort of mental universe of this ancient civilization, what they were thinking. And you've got um, bills and sort of, you know, boring documents, political things, but 
above all, what comes out is this absolute obsession with the sky. They um, have all these celestial omens about what different events in the sky meant. They thought that these were warnings from the gods, essentially, about terrible things that were going to happen on Earth. So I talked about this holistic universe where people saw changes on Earth and sky as kind of entwined, but they absolutely took it to extremes. Um, anything from a planet changing direction to uh, a lunar eclipse, you know, these were all things that were uh, warning people on Earth about what was going to happen. Um, and so for the king, he had priests of uh, astronomers who would be looking at the sky, noting down what was happening every night. Um, yeah, sort of correlating that with what was happening, warning the king about omens so that he could sort of conduct the appropriate rituals. A lunar eclipse often meant the death of the king, for example. So the, the king would step aside, put a sort of a gardener or a criminal or a beggar on the throne for a while um, and then that person will be executed so then the omen would have come true the king was dead and the real king could safely come back on again so they were sort of obsessed with everything that was going on in the sky and the, the Babylonians were the best at this they pioneered this whole kind of cosmic view they, their priests were watching the sky for centuries before Ashurbanipal centuries after and because they were noting down what was happening in the sky night after night they started to recognize repeating cycles, patterns. Uh, so even things like the subtle variation in speed of the sun and the moon, which you would hardly notice uh, normally, or um, wanderings of the planets, which you know seem to be quite erratic, they started to realize that there were actually repeating cycles and patterns. Um, patterns of eclipses roughly repeat every 18 years, for example, the path of Venus every eight years. And so they were able to start predicting what was gonna happen. Um, and then around 400 BC, they came up with an invention that made them even more powerful, uh, which was the zodiac. So they took the ecliptic, the circle or the path that the sun takes through the sky against the background stars through the year, and divided that 360 degree circle into 12, 30 degree segments and named each one after a constellation. So that is the origins of you know the zodiac that we still have today. Uh, and we associate it with astrology, but the, the reason that they came up with this was so that they could have an accurate coordinate system in the sky, like a scale. So if there was an event in the sky, a planet changes direction, they can note down to the degree where it happened. And that made their observations much more accurate. They were soon able to come up with very sophisticated mathematical models for computing the changing position of celestial bodies in the sky. They could tell you, you know, any particular day what, exactly where that celestial body was going to be. So through that obsession with the omens, they became the first people to use mathematics to make sense of the sky and to start understanding and predicting these patterns. You know, they'd gone from a, a qualitative universe, if you like, to a, to a quantitative one. So for me, that was the beginnings of it all. Uh, the Greeks, they had a much more qualitative view. Um, they were, you know, they had these uh, this idea of these sort of lovely spherical orbits, these sort of perfect, um, circular paths that the, the planets um, were taking and these nested spheres. Um, and they didn't really have any accurate observations. They weren't putting accurate numbers to any of this. It was just a sort of geometrical kind of scheme. And it wasn't until the Greeks came into contact with the Babylonians and realized that they have these incredibly accurate arithmetical observations and models that those two traditions really came together. And we had what we would now think of as a more sort of scientific astronomy. And you know, there's lots of other things that we owe to the Babylonians as well, but that, for me, the beginnings of a scientific mathematical view of the universe, it, it starts there. Um, we're getting a question in from uh, Sarah who says, they must have had some way of recording all these events and how long it was between happenings. What, yeah. what was that way? Well, they had astronomical diaries, essentially. So they would, I mean, it's, it's all done on clay tablets so that you, you you know, you've got the cut end of a reed and so they're inscribing into these clay tablets. And so they had what, yeah, the equivalent of diaries, which have been found. So it's just um, noting it down night after night. And then those would get sort of the data from there would be taken and kind of compiled and then put, you know, into a more kind of um, collated form, if you like, where they're actually then comparing and, and pulling out these repeated cycles. But I mean, this is over centuries. It was a very gradual process but yeah they had some really clever maths for doing this yeah now then it was the egyptians 
who kind of introduced the idea, not just of the soul, but of the sky as the soul's ultimate destination. Is that correct? This, am, am I understanding that correctly? Did that, is that what they did? Yeah, so then I move on from the Babylonians to look at, um, so each chapter in the book is kind of has a different theme to it, a different uh, sort of areas of human life where the cosmos has been, been important and how beliefs about the cosmos have shaped the way that we live now. So I go on to look at religion um, and obviously right since the beginning societies have seen sort of gods and, and mythical beings in, in the sky. The, the cosmos is just really you know, there are gods, obviously, for, you know, on Earth as well, but the, the sky and celestial bodies, that's just a sort of, again, the qu quintessential sort of source of the d divine. People have obviously always had sort of spiritual experiences when looking up at the stars. Um, but I'm looking at where did different beliefs come from? So I, I, do, I look at the origins of, of Christianity, for example, and how many of the beliefs from the sort of pagan uh, worship of the sun were translated across into Christianity and that helped to make it easier for people to, to convert the Emperor Constantine in the, in the fourth century AD. He was really instrumental in making this happen. And it was a sort of very clever thing that he did of sort of almost merging the solar worship with early Christianity. So you had worship on a Sunday, praying towards the East where the sun rises, you've got the timings of, of Christmas just after the winter solstice, Easter just after the spring equinox, um, taking on traditions from the, the solar uh, worship, for example, with the trees and, 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 and candles for celebrating the winter solstice. So it made it easy for people to, to convert. Um, but early Christianity didn't have the sort of same idea of, of, of heaven and our souls going up to heaven that we have now. Um, if you look at uh, Judaism that preceded it, or you look at the Old Testament, um, you have descriptions of sort of palaces and gates in the in the sky, stone floors. It wasn't some and it wasn't somewhere where ordinary people would get to go after they died. And and there are historians looking at this who think that actually that idea may have come from the ancient Egyptians. So the Egyptians had very complicated religions, but they had this key idea of, of the Pharaoh that after he died would sort of be reincarnated and his soul would travel up either to the sun or to the, to the stars, um, perhaps coming back down each night and being reborn every morning. Um, and that's something that over time, they, they had there were sort of spells that were written on the inside of the pyramids that helped the Pharaoh to do this. And then later that evolved and, and these became um, text that that anyone could sort of have written on their, their coffin and the idea that sort of other people normal people would could also have a soul that went up to, to heaven um, and that seems to have influenced Greek philosophers like Plato who then sort of took that idea on this idea that we come from the stars and we return to the stars um, after after we die so although the Egyptians weren't as advanced as the Babylonians in terms of the maths they had a more sort of metaphysical contribution yeah. Uh, this, yeah. this idea of heaven and the soul and that we come from the sky. Well, we talked about the sun. Let's talk about the moon a bit. I've always been a massive fan of the moon. I love watching the moon and staring up at the moon. Um, and uh, my understanding from the book is that people's feelings about the importance of the moon have they keep changing over time. You tell a really, really poignant story about um, Frank Brown and his oysters and how he did all this amazing work and then he was denigrated for it. And now people are starting to re-examine it. So can we talk about some of the, um, you, you also talk about coral and lunar clocks and women's menstrual cycles and loads and loads of things. So I'm curious, can we, can we encapsulate that in a, in a, short snippet for the, the audience tonight? <laughs> I'll do my best. I don't know if anyone saw the full moon at the weekend, just gone. It was just absolutely beautiful. Um, yeah, so the, the moon is something that we know people have been fascinated by. Again, ever since the Paleolithic, there's a, 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 a sort of female figure carved into a, a Paleolithic cave in, in France. Um, and she, she seems to be 
pregnant she's got one hand on her belly but in the other hand she's holding this crescent like a crescent bison horn that's uh got 13 strokes on it um which is thought to be to do with the number of days between sort of the, the new crescent moon and the, and the full moon it was originally sprinkled with red ochre as well so you've got mm. this sort of blood red this pregnant woman the crescent mm. the, the um the cycle of the moon so from really, really early on, people were clearly interested in the moon, had linked it to fertility and, and reproduction and, and timekeeping. Um, the word for, for moon, I mean, that's obviously linked to menstruation, but it's also a root may, which means I measure. So this cycle of the moon in the sky, sort of dramatically changing, seems to have been a cycle that people sort of followed and used to measure time from, from really early on. Um, you've also got that sort of new crescent appearing and then the moon becoming full and then waning again and then the three days of darkness and then the new moon being born so that has also been really important in kind of symbolism and mythology and religion in lots of parts of the world lots of stories of um birth death darkness and, and rebirth that seem to come from that cycle of the moon um also lots of stories about madness and, and mania being linked to the full moon where yeah that kind of thing um so you there are lots of different stories told about the moon all around the planet you know sometimes the moon's female sometimes it's male sometimes you know people talk about the moon as a sort of horizontal bowl that holds water that spills when it rains sometimes you know people see a rabbit in the moon or we see a man in the moon so there are differences but there are these themes around um fertility and reproduction and then sort of madness psychology um and then science though until fairly recently has been quite biologists have been quite skeptical about sort of lunar influences um maybe because of all the, the sort of folk tales and these mythological beliefs i think there's been a feeling that sort of lunar influences are somehow kind of pseudoscientific and biologists looking at um biological clocks for example and biological rhythms have been much more focused on the sun on those daily circadian rhythms which we now know are really important encoded in our dna that the sun's 24 hour cycle is driving pretty much every aspect of our biology. But anyone who wanted to focus on the moon has been kind of sidelined. And yeah, I tell the story of Frank Brown, who he, he it was in the 1950s, he took oysters um, from the sea off the east coast of America and he shipped them inland um, to Illinois, where he worked. And he put them in tanks of water in this sort of sealed dark room that was cut off from all environmental cues. So light and dark, um, anything to do with water currents or, or time of day, any changes in temperature. And he was interested because they, they open to feed at, um, at high tide. So they have this kind of lunar rhythm that goes with the tides when they feed. And he wanted to know if they could keep time, would they keep that rhythm even when they were completely cut off from any environmental cues? And not only did they keep the rhythm, but actually over a few weeks, they shifted by three hours and then they they, they stopped and they kept that new rhythm with this three hour lag. Um, and he realized that they what they'd actually done was they'd adjusted their time to match the local state of the moon. So if Illinois had been by the sea, when there would have been high tide in Illinois, um, which is just incredible, like somehow they were sensing what was happening with the moon. And so he, was, became convinced from that. He had lots of other studies after that in, in other species that the moon is really important for biology and for timekeeping and that changes in light and dark aren't the full story, that there are other sort of cosmic cues, he didn't know what at the time, um, that were influencing our biology. And he was, yeah, as you say, he was pretty much thrown out of the field. The other biologists, um, yeah, but sort of um, ganged up on him, essentially. Um, and he wasn't taken um, particularly seriously at the time. But but now there's a lot of research showing that actually he really was onto something. Um, first of all, just the importance of the moon in biological rhythms as work, particularly in marine species, showing that there are lunar clocks and that they are also genetically encoded. There are hundreds of genes that, that vary their activity with the phase of the moon. And this is in um, fish, corals, marine worms. So very distantly related species. And so most of the work is very, very recent, just the last few years, and it's been on marine animals so far. But the researchers say that because you've got them in such diverse species, these lunar clocks must date from very 
early in evolution. So it would be surprising if there wasn't some form of um, lunar clocks in humans as well. Um, there are also lots of examples of um, different species that live by the, the moon. So you've got even on land, um, Serengeti wildebeest, for example, use the moon to time their conception so that calves are born um, at the right time, sort of safely ahead of their spring uh, migration. Uh, you've got um, North American birds, whippoorwills, whose chicks will hatch at new moon so that two weeks later, when their energy demand is the highest, will be the full moon when there's light for the parents to hunt insects. Um, and so you've got all of these different examples. Um, there's one, there's one other, it's an, again, it's an aquatic one, but I really like it, which is that in the ocean, plankton will uh, sink down during the day, hiding from predators, and then it rises up again at night. So this huge migration of biomass every day down and coming back up again. But in the Arctic Ocean, in, um, in the winter, when the sun doesn't rise, biologists have found that that entire cycle switches to follow the moon. So it's following a 24.8 hour day rather than a 24 hour day. So this just this whole cycle is is now a lunar one. And so it seems that sort of ancestrally the the moon has been a really important cue for biology as well as the, the sun. The two go together. Um, and you know we don't really notice it so much now, um, but it has been really important. And in, in humans, there there's been a lot of argument about does the moon drive our menstrual cycles? Um, does it make, does the full moon make people, people go a bit mad? Um, mm -hmm. And there were studies sort of suggesting this, um, and then there were other studies saying, no, there's no effect. Um, but now researchers are coming around to, to thinking that actually the reason that that effect wasn't showing up is because so few of us now are actually exposed to the light of the moon. Like, yeah. You wouldn't expect there to be effect because you know we, we we don't have that that environmental cue. And actually, when you allow for that, um, there are some more recent studies now, for example, suggesting that um, suicides and depression um, can be linked to the phase of the moon, um, and also that moonlight can entrain women's menstrual cycles. So there's a kind of more of an open mindedness about that now. And I'm just going to mention one other thing, which is that um, this is all to do with light from the moon. But there was a really fascinating study uh, a couple of years ago looking at patients with bipolar disorder um, where they have these sudden changes in mood that are linked to changes in patterns of sleep. And these patients track the timing of that over many years. Um, and what the researchers found was that 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 timing of the sort of change in sleep which then led to their switches in mood was being driven by the moon it was following um the sort of gravitational cycle of the moon and this wasn't nothing to do with the phase of the moon it couldn't have anything, been anything to do with moonlight it was to do with sort of tidal effects of the position of the moon in the sky um, and that study's got a lot of attention because it's not immediately clear how that could be happening um one poss possibility is maybe are we sensitive to these gravitational effects. Um, it's not physically impossible, but we don't have a mechanism for that. Mm -hmm. um, another suggestion is that it could be to do with changing magnetic fields because the, the sun and the moon, as they move around the earth, create little subtle ripples in the strength of the earth's magnetic field. Um, and there are some others, I mean, we, we know that a lot of species are sensitive to these changes. Um, and there are a few little bits of evidence now that possibly humans are as well. So it's a just really interesting time for the for the research after a long time of biologists really dismissing the idea of sort of magnetic sensing or lunar influences. Now there's a kind of realization that actually there is a lot more going on. We're much more plugged into these sort of cosmic cues than we ever realized. So we should watch the research and see what comes out of it. Um, Adrian's asking, can you pinpoint a single moment when humankind started thinking of the stars and the sky as part of a shared physical universe with ours rather than a celestial realm? Um, yeah, that's, isn't that a good question? Um, it, I mean, all of these things are gradual processes, but there are sort of definitely milestones along the way. Um, I think Galileo was, cl was clearly one that when he pointed his telescope at the sky and Previous to that, you've got these sort of these lights that are moving in the sky, often thought of as sort of 
perfect divine celestial beings, this whole kind of other realm that's different from the sort of more uh, corrupt terrestrial earth. But he is looking up there and he's seeing craters on the moon. Um, he's um, seeing um, phases of, of, of planets. Um, he's seeing the moons around different planets. So he's looking and seeing details mm -hmm. which are showing that these aren't these sort of perfect, magical, mysterious lights, but they are physical objects um, with features just like we see uh, on Earth. So that was um, one key one. Um, there's also Newton with his sort of universal laws of, of motion and gravitation showing that, you know, the celestial bodies, again, are not divine creatures that are moving at their own whim, but they're following the same physical laws as, as, as all of us. Um, so there's that unity there as well. Um, another um, development that is talked about less, but that I think is just as influential is the invention of spectroscopy as a way of um, analyzing the light that comes from stars uh, because this was in the the 19th century um, but before this there was a sense that we would you know we could look to the stars and from a scientific point of view you could describe their appearance you could describe their motion but we would never understand their chemical composition the astronomer royal and, and various other eminent scientists just said this is an example of knowledge we can never have we can never know scientifically what the stars are made of because they're too far away we can't get a sample of them to analyze um, so anyone who thinks that they can speculate about that that's not science um, within just a few years um, chem uh, a chemist and a physicist in Germany so Robert Bunsen who we know from inventing the Bunsen burner um, and his physicist friend Gustav Kirchhoff, um, they invent. I mean, they were they were building on again sort of work that had gone before them, but they invented this piece of kit called a spectroscope. So it came about because they were interested in why different elements burn with different color flames. And so the idea was, well, rather than just analyzing different colors by eye, you know, that flame's green, that flame's a bit blue use a prism to separate the light into a spectrum. So you've got lots of frequency bands and you can look at the presence and absence of different frequency bands. So you've gone from a sort of qualitative approach into a quantitative one. You're not just experiencing the colors, you're actually measuring these different bands. Um, and the real breakthrough was the idea of using that on sunlight and starlight. So Bunsen and Kirchhoff used it on the sun to show the presence of chemical elements in the sun. So they showed that it's not true that we can never know what's going on with the sun and the stars. The sun has the same chemical elements, the same chemistry as we have on Earth, which, which was revolutionary at the time. And then there was a, a husband and wife uh, called William and Mary Huggins, um, who lived in Tulse Hill in London, just around the corner from, from me in, uh, in the 19th century. And they had... Um, a telescope in their back garden and they used a prism to look at the much weaker starlight and showed that that's true for stars as well that so not just in our solar system but across the universe these stars are not just these mysterious lights but they're physical objects that follow physical laws that are you know build at just the same chemical building blocks as we find on earth so it's it's been a, a uh yeah a progression but mm -hmm. these are all sort of developments that have helped us to see that it's not magical or, or special you know what's going on out there it's it's following it's matter following the same kinds of scientific laws as we are familiar with yeah you, you talked talk about, about this, about this idea. Idea. sorry, I'm, sorry here. I'm here for echo can you hear me echo no it sounds good it sounds good okay sorry um there's you talk about the idea of the gradual but it struck me reading the book that there is a moment when humanity moved from predominantly hunter-gatherer to farming. And that, for me, seemed like the, the pivotal, pivotal moment when we really started backing away from nature, from separating from it, trying to control it and impose ourselves on it rather than be in it. Um, would that be a correct reading? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it was the definitely a key moment and probably the first 
key transition that we could really pinpoint. Yeah, so this is going back now to the boundary between the Paleolithic, you were talking about the cave paintings, and the Neolithic, and this the revolution of farming, of agriculture, when people started to control and exploit the nature that was around them. Before that, they were kind of on equal footing with, with other animals. And I talk about this in the book because there's a really fascinating site in Turkey called Gobekli Tepe. It dates from the 10th millennium BC. So later than Lascaux Cave, but, but still um, sort of 6,000 years older than Stonehenge, for example. And it's uh, a series of circular enclosures that are dug into a hillside. Um, and there's kind of a, a, a bench around the edge of each circular enclosure with these weird flat T-shaped pillars that are spaced all the way around. And in the middle, you've got a pair of bigger T-shaped pillars. And these are more than five meters high. So really big stone monuments that would have taken large numbers of people to, um, to, to construct. And this is the oldest site like this we know of these sort of big stone constructions it has been described as the world's first temple and what's really interesting is that this is exactly the place in the world where farming is about to arise and this site dates from just before that happened and so it's telling us something about what was happening with people just before that split away from nature um, and you've got these enclosures um, and the, so these T-shaped pillars, they're carved with uh, belts, uh, loincloths, necklaces. So they, they seem to be intended as some kind of human-like figures. Um, on one of them, there's a, a symbol with a, a disc and a crescent. Uh, so um, it's been suggested that that represents the moon. Maybe this is even some kind of moon deity. Um, and one idea is you've got these flat tops of these pillars up on the hillside. You know, was this meant as some kind of observatory where people sighting stars? And the archaeologists working there saying, no, actually, that's not very likely because they think that they, these enclosures were dug down into the ground, probably had roofs over. But they do seem to have been about how people saw their cosmos because um, there, was, there was an obsession with death here for a start. There were lots of skulls have been excavated. They've got, they seem to have been hung up for display inside these enclosures. Uh, you couldn't just go in through a door. There were little portholes that you had to crawl through to get inside, um, surrounded by carvings, things like animals on their backs, for example. There are lots of carvings of kind of poisonous or dangerous or ferocious animals here. And the, the researchers working there think that these enclosures represented uh, portals to the underworld, to the, the cosmic realm of the dead, if you like, and that these T-shaped pillars were some kind of transcendent beings, maybe human ancestors. So it it seems like, well, first of all, it definitely seems like a shift in mindset. So first mm -hmm. of all, in the Paleolithic, you had these sort of animals in the sky. Now we've got it's very much the humans that are taking center stage. We've got this focus on human ancestors. So it's as if humans are now seeing themselves as separate from, raised above nature somehow. But also the fact that rather than, um, I talk a bit in the book about how in the Paleolithic caves, were people going into caves for kind of spiritual experiences and altered states of consciousness. I talk a bit about shamanism. Now you've got they're, they're actually building their own portals to, to other realms. But they're starting to exploit the environment. And the, the idea that's being built there by different researchers who are looking at this is that this was a shift in mindset in cosmology where people were seeing themselves as split away from nature. They're starting to exploit their environment. They're building their own portals to other realms. That was sort of, that was the key shift that changed people's relationship to nature that then made farming conceivable like technically they could have done it long before but that shift in mindset about you know where you're putting yourself in a position where you could start to exploit other species that was what had to happen first that allowed farming to happen which has then been so important for sort of kicking off our technological progress you know everything that's really defined our species ever since and what about the invention of timekeeping and clocks um because it strikes me that that also really changed the way society dealt with each other 
the way they dealt with the, the natural rhythms. Again, it was imposing something onto what was already naturally in existence. Yeah, well, I look at both space and time in the book because these are both things that have been sort of shaped by the sky. It was always the sky initially that told us when and, and where we were. You know, you've got the, the sun obviously rising and setting every day. You've got the moon showing you the months, the seasons for the year. The stars are also circling through the night and different risings and settings of constellations through the year. So it's the, originally it was the sky that was telling people that the season, the time. There was no uh, separate sense of time ticking by as, that we have now, something that you can measure and count. And there are still uh, societies living today who have that view of time. They have no concept of abstract time, no word for time. There is only the events that they experience uh, in their environment and in the sky. Um, and it's the same for a sense of space as well, that initially if you wanted to know where you were on the planet um, or which direction you were facing you have to look up it's the stars that that tell us that um, so from very uh, earliest human history but then also the ancient greeks for example when they start mapping the planet it was only through looking and making astronomical observations of the sky that they could work out that the, the planet is a sphere and work out what size it is and start to map different places so everything to do with time and space has really come from the sky. And in both of those areas, we've kind of, we, we've abstracted them, if you like, rather than um, our experience of the sky and of the cosmos telling us when and where we are, we've developed ways of um, creating a sort of mathematical mm -hmm. time and space. So with the, in, I talk about the invention of mechanical clocks um, at the end of the 13th century, and this was, medieval monks who became they were sort of obsessed with wanting to pray at very accurate times because that would strengthen the power of their their worship um and so they uh invented sort of geared mechanisms clockwork essentially um and the key uh uh invention in being able to do that was a little piece of um the clock called an escapement it's this oscillating mechanism it rocks backwards and forwards so rather than just having a continuous flow you know they tried to have weights falling on a rope that would drive their mechanisms but they just accelerate when, as they fall to the ground it's not controlled it's not at a constant speed but you add in this little rocking thing that alternately blocks and releases the gear wheels and that controls the movement and allows everything to run at a constant speed um, but what you've done is you've chopped up that continuous flow of time into something that you can count that's the seconds the, the ticks of the clock so again you've gone from a continuous qualitative experience of time flowing to this mathematical thing that you can count and as clocks have become more accurate they've actually become more accurate than the cosmos they will run at a more constant rate than the sun does in the sky so the very first clocks were these huge astronomical display pieces they showed the sun the moon the planets eclipses because T people, you know, time was inseparable from the, the cosmos. People were modeling the cosmos when they were telling time. But as clocks became more accurate, they sort of left the cosmos behind, if you like. People just dropped those astronomical displays. Now clocks are all about uh, telling time in their own right. So it's just an example of how time used to be held in the sky and in the cosmos. And now it's this um, thing that you can measure it's almost like money an abstract quantity you know we we count it we spend it we save it we we waste it so uh, a sort of separate thing that's that's held in our clocks and, and similarly for space as well i tell the story of how uh captain cook visited Ta tahiti um mm -hmm. uh and he met this uh, priest there, and it was this real clash of, of cultures where Captain Cook was sailing and he was using instruments and charts and these astronomical observations and lengthy calculations. And, and so you've got the, the, these maps, which was like a sort of grid of longitude and latitude, this mathematical space that you can um, move across. Um, and then meeting uh, Tupaya, this priest, and finding out that the Polynesians had been navigating across thousands of miles of Pacific Ocean for, for, for centuries without any of these instruments or observations or charts. They had a purely subjective view. They used their sort of own um, bearings, sort of star compass, so the direction of different stars on the horizon combined with lots of other things like watching wildlife and, and 
weather and water currents mm. and they always remained rather than moving across a map they would always be at the center of their, their cosmos with the ocean flowing around them so again just trying to show how we've moved from this sort of qualitative view where it's our experience of our surroundings that's telling us things like when and where we are so now we have this sort of the, the technology and the instruments and it's the mathematical measurements that gives us that information so here we are we've got two minutes left i want to circle all the way back to awe i want to um how can we reconnect with the awe how can we reconnect with the cosmos what what do you rec we science is wonderful it's fascinating we we've done amazing things thanks to science but we i think and i think the message of your book is we need to get back to the cosmos as well. What are your recommendations? What are you doing? Do you do anything to, to reconnect with, with your awe and with the cosmos? And we'll end on that. Okay. Um, yeah, so you're absolutely right. That ended up being the, the message of the, the book for me that um, we've built this wonderful knowledge of science, which has been so effective. We've developed this amazing technology. It's given us all this freedom and convenience, but scientists themselves are realizing that there are downsides to that so when we sep you know when we separate ourselves from the biological rhythms of the sun and the moon for example we know that that impacts on our biological clocks and causes health problems neuroscientists looking at what happens to the brain when we use gps to navigate and we don't pay attention to our surroundings with our own eyes that's causing changes in the brain makes us we focus less on our surroundings. We're less able to navigate for ourselves. We make stupid mistakes because we're focusing too much on a screen. Um, even with clocks, we now know that when you focus, when you, well, um, as you measure time more accurately, there's this phenomenon called time famine, where we all feel sort of rushed all the time, like constantly, we don't have enough time. Um, so there are these psychological and physical impacts. And then all was one of the most uh, compelling I think is another reason why our personal experience matters. So we have the scientific understanding, that's great, but the research on awe showing how it connects us to a bigger picture, it changes our perspective, it you know, makes us more generous, it makes us care more about the planet. Um, I think that is, is really compelling for why it matters that we don't just focus on our screens all the time. The awe researchers themselves warn that of this, something they call uh, an uh, an awe deficit or deprivation uh, where when we're always looking at our screens and we're not confronted by the vast horizons of, of nature that that we become more selfish and, and more narcissistic so I think to deal with all of the challenges that we have on this, this planet we are going to need uh, some awe um, and there are lots of places we can get that but the, the starry sky is one of them and one of the things that made me really want to write this book was the fact that it's disappearing um, mm. Every society through history has been inspired by the heavens. It's, it's shaped so many things about our lives. We haven't had a chance to talk about how it's influenced power and politics or our art, for example. Um, and now with light pollution, instead of thousands of stars in the sky in our cities today, we see just a few dozen, even on a clear night. 80% uh, of us in Europe and the US can't see the Milky Way at all. And I, I just think that that's this catastrophic erosion of of cultural heritage because it's been so important through our history but also we we need that view that connection that personal connection um for how we live now um so i think we should fight for dark sky reserves i think that's yeah. really important yeah. um but i think we, we can all kind of find ways to um integrate the the cosmos into our lives i mean i live in london so i don't have a, a dark sky uh, unfortunately but you know, with my neighbours, we've got, you know, we've got telescopes out on the street and you look up and you can see um, the rings of Saturn and the moons of Jupiter, for example. That is awe inspiring. Um, I work, my office is in a loft. And so when I look out of the window in the morning, I can see the sun rising and I've become really aware of how the point of sunrise shifts through the year. And there's a time before Christmas where it goes around the corner and I can't see it. And then this spring, it's just come back. And so I've felt that connection to the solstice um, uh, but even just being aware of the stars thinking about when, we, when we're facing north you're you're facing the sort of the pole and the you know the point at which the earth is spinning around in space for example just being aware of those more cosmic influences I think just lifts us and expands our awareness so I think 
dark skies, we should absolutely be fighting for those. But there are also lots of other ways that we can be aware. And just knowing all the stories as well of how people have connected through history, I think, connects us to all of those societies that have gone before as well. Well, let me just, I'm just going to sneak in. I know we're, we're pushing the, the boat here with uh, the timing, but there's one more question I must ask you. It comes from Kira, who says, the solar eclipse certainly made me feel somewhat skewed and out of my normal. And, and that was just from a mere glimpse. How much do you think the myths and the stories have a placebo effect on our human systems? Um. Yeah, interesting question. Yeah, so I mean, the placebo effect is very close to my heart because my previous book, Cure, was about um, the influence of the mind, our expectations, hopes, yeah. beliefs um, on our on our physical body. And that's something else that scientists have been quite sceptical about. But research now is showing that absolutely our mental state is crucially important for our, our physiology Um and really important in medicine, whether we feel safe, cared for, whether we you know, have positive expectations for how we're gonna do in the future, um, whether we sort of trust our, our carer, all these things really matter. And it's sort of been dismissed in before as a sort of placebo effect, as, oh, you've been fooled, um, it, it, it isn't real, you don't really feel better. But now we're realizing that no, these are real physical effects that really matter in medicine and we need to be able to wrap those in. You know, we're treating m people with minds and not just bodies. So it's interesting to think about placebo effects in terms of our relationship with the cosmos and, and, and the myths. Um, yeah, I don't, I mean, I don't know exactly what you'd mean by a placebo effect in, in terms of an eclipse, but I think, um, yeah, I think certainly when you look at astrology, for example, when people feel, you know, there's no scientific reason why positions of this, you know, the planets, for example, should affect us. But when if you have a belief about it and you're you're looking for connections, I think they can become a bit self-fulfilling that if you feel that good luck is coming your way or that you you know, you believe that you're an optimistic person or you're looking for connections, that will change your outlook on life and that, you know, that will open different doors for you and then help you to make different connections. So I think there is definitely that there, that just the where we put our attention, mm -hmm. what we're expecting, all of these things will change, um, you know, the events and, and our choices that we make in our lives. Well, I think what you've just said is that the stories we tell ourselves are powerful the stories in here are extremely powerful. We've only skimmed the surface of them. Um, I just want to remind everybody that this book is for sale in the festival bookshop. You can also make a donation so we can keep having wonderful guests like Joe back here. And Joe, it's my great honor to thank you for being with us tonight. It's been a fascinating conversation and I just wish it could have been three times as long. So thanks very much. Thank you so much for having me.